This is something that you have to have. You have to have between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمَ إِذِ انْتَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا شَرْقِيًّا فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيًّا قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقيا قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما زكيا قالت أنا يكون لي غلام ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أك بغيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هين وَلِنَجْعَلَهُ آيَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَرَحْمَةً مِنَّا وَكَانَ أَمْرًا مَقْضِيًّا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمْ إِذِ انْتَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا شَرْقِيًّا فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا Allah says, and remember in the book Maryam, when she took from her family, when she separated from her family, a place towards the east. Maryam is in a chamber, in her prayer chamber in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she is holding it down for Bani Israel. She's one of the few who hasn't been corrupted. She's one of the few who's still worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at an incredibly high level. And even then, she still separates from her family to find seclusion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, further seclusion with Allah. She goes somewhere to the east, whether it's east of Jerusalem, some of the scholars of tafsir said, east even within Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. But she radiallahu anha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alayhi salam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace be upon her. She shows us this idea of separation. She shows us this idea of separation. There's a spiritual health in separating from people. The Prophet وسلم, before he became a prophet, he would, Aisha radiallahu anha says in the hadith of Bukhari, right at the beginning, she says that he used to go to Ghar Hira Yatahannath. He used to go and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of, the, one of the indications of prophethood or one of the precursors of prophethood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired in him is that solitude became beloved to him. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go into that cave and he used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for extended period of time. And then he would go back home just to get more supplies to go back and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some more. He would be alone with his Lord. And we're all in need of this. We're in need of disconnecting from people to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, welcome to the rain in Al-Quds. Alhamdulillah. And we are at the birthplace of a Sayyidah Maryam. This is currently a church where Anne, it's the church of Saint Anne, which is Maryam's mother. And when you get a idea of the distance, so this is the house of Ali Imran, this is where they resided. And it's around 60 steps to Al Masjid Al Aqsa. We're going to turn around, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to show you Al Masjid Al Aqsa. And then we're going to walk in the rain, inshallah ta'ala, to where Maryam alayhi salam used to go and seclude herself, inshallah. Okay, so you see the bricks over there? That's in Masjid al-Aqsa. So this is the house. Maryam alayhi salam used to come and she used to walk towards the masjid. This is the eastern part of Masjid al-Aqsa. And obviously there weren't all of these buildings and parking lots and all of that. So she used to walk a straight walk to the masjid and she used to serve the masjid. And how did she used to serve the masjid? She used to clean the masjid. She used to perfume the masjid. She used to secure water for the masjid and she used to secure food for the masjid. So that was her service of al-Masjid al-Aqsa, as well as her own seclusion and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try to sneak in and see if we can find the house or any of the actual 
what the oldest structure is in this place and then we'll go find where Maryam alayhi salam used to seclude herself. As you can see, as far as the Masjid al-Aqsa, this is the Lion's Gate or it's called Bab al -Asbat. This right here is called the Sabil of Maryam. It was a public water fountain built in the 16th century, also known as the Sabil of Sit Maryam. It was built during the Ottomans, of course. And this gate, which is called Bab al -Asbat, was also called the Gate of Maryam. The Gate of Maryam to enter into a Masjid al-Aqsa. And so, as you can see here to the right, this is a Masjid al-Aqsa, that's the main gate. And right here is the house of Maryam. So they're very close to each other. And now we're going to go towards the east. So we're going to go east. And inshallah, we're going to follow in the footsteps of Maryam alayhi salam. So the Masjid al-Aqsa is to her right. And that is the, uh, that's the, we're already in the eastern side of the masjid and she would walk down this hill for seclusion to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just worshiping in the masjid but finding her own solitude and finding her own khalwa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we're going to walk down here and we're going to see the area or the location where Maryam alayhi salam was in seclusion when she was visited by the angel Jibreel so you can see, looking down, this must have all been a hill. I mean, it's still a hill, but this must have all been um, greenery. It's a, one thing that people don't really appreciate about Palestine coming here until they come here is how lush and how green and how beautiful everything is. The purpose of seclusion is to have something between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nobody knows about. And one of the great acts of worship is tafakkur. Tafakkur is to contemplate the creation of Allah. And that is one of the things that we suffer from living in urbanized communities. Everything around us is man-made. We don't wonder uh, at the trees. We don't see the might of the mountains. We don't see the change in seasons. All of this is that all of these are signs by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah mentions them as signs for people who reflect all of the time. So what happens to a people who don't see the signs? That's a surefire way for a deadened heart. It's a recipe for a deadened heart. And so now we're coming down the hill, we're at the, the base of the hill here, which is uh, we're just kind of being stared at, but let's cross the street. And so, Maryam alayhi salam in this region over here is where her seclusion was. And this is only a, a, a five minute walk from her house. It's not that she necessarily went very far, but she's able to leave the area of the masjid. She's able to leave the area of her house. And down this hill is where she would worship. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, or upon her be peace. Now, in this section here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِن دُونِهِمْ hijaba. She took between her and her family a hijab, a barrier. What is that barrier? The barrier is that mountain. And so she had this mountain in between her and her family. We just descended down the side of this mountain. And so now she's got this mountain between her and her family. They're on the other side. You don't see anything, and amazingly, this mountain there's nothing been there's been nothing built on it in two thousand years. It's just been left as is. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "فَتَخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا." And so we sent our messenger. And so while she was here in seclusion with this mountain as a barrier between her and her people, she is surprised by the visit of the angel. And then, of course, the story continues. Welcome. You're crossing the street? Okay. And then of course the story continues where Maryam alayhi salam is visited by the angel and then she becomes impregnated and she then after that فَحَمْلَتْهُ فَانْتَبَذَتْ بِهِ مَكَانًا قصية. So where does she go? 
she becomes pregnant with the baby and she then secludes herself a second time and she goes to a far off place from here she takes this pathway down to Bethlehem so this is Maryam's world that's her masjid Al Masjid Al Aqsa that's her masjid Be behind that mountain is her house that's the mountain this is where her place of seclusion is and that's the wadi that's the valley that took her to where Isa alayhi salam would be born Maryam's entire world is in this area right here alayhi salam as for where she died let's come up here as we come up here as where to where Maryam alayhi salam is said to have passed away is down at the bottom of this hill you see this church and so where she's born there's a church and where it said that she passed away there is a church as well alayhi salam so birth to service to death and everything in between other than going and giving birth in Bethlehem. This was her general world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I want you to separate between physical seclusion and spiritual seclusion. Physical seclusion is what we're all going through. People just want to sit in their rooms and scroll through social media and not really interact with people because interacting with people is kind of toxic or difficult or challenging or boring or inconvenient. I have a poem about inconvenience that goes, people don't want to get married anymore. People don't invite each other over anymore. When was the last time you invited someone over to your house? I'm talking before the pandemic. There's a level of intimacy and vulnerability and inconvenience, that's it. We don't ever want to be inconvenience and relationships are full of inconvenience and deep friendships where people are committed to each other and carry each other's burdens and go through the terrors of life together is inconvenient it's just easier to swipe left or to share than to care it's easier to just skim on the surface of everyone's existence never to be inconvenienced but the cost of that superficiality is depth and meaning and love those things are paid for by a lifetime of inconvenience and sacrifices. And those that opt out of payment will get loneliness for free. And there's plenty of that to go around. So that's not what physical seclusion we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual seclusion. And spiritual seclusion is that a person sits at home and yes, they might be by themselves, but they're not engaged in devices. They have no devices other than their heart and their tongue and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. I have a question for you that I want you to comment on. I want you to, you know, let's, let's uh, and I, I look forward to reading these comments. I want you to ask yourself the question, what is the longest that you've gone recently? Recently, not before you ever got a cell phone in 2003. I'm talking about now. What was the most recent time what was the longest time you went through recently without a device? Without your cell phone, without your, even if it's just been 30 minutes or an hour, but it's something that you disconnect and you're comfortable with. You don't reach out to your phone. You are able to sit and be introspective and reflective or maybe journal or contemplate with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even those who teach and preach, by the way, are in need of this. Sometimes we spend more time talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than talking to Allah. There was a man who became very successful in his community giving da'wah. And when he was asked like, so what are your tools and tricks? Like, is it, you know, your, is it your interpersonal skills? Is it your knowledge? What is it? And he said, I talk to my community about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I talk to Allah about my community. A person has to have what's called a, a wirt, a daily devotional. People have to have dhikr, they have to have worship, they have to have something, not just that, a daily devotional, but there also has to be acts of worship that are private between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody knows about it, nobody. And if in that solitude, you have a moment where your eye wells up with tears, then that tear becomes so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us that there are seven who are shaded in the shade of Allah on the day where there is no shade except for His. 
And one of those groups of people, categories of people, is a person who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude and a tear falls, their eyes well up. But not just that, that spiritual solitude with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be one of your most, if not your most pleasurable experience in this world. Al Fudayl ibn Iyad, he said that if the sons of kings knew, if the kings and their sons knew the pleasure that we had, meaning in that that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would have fought us over it with swords. They would have tried to snatch it away from us. If they could, if they could take it from us, they would have taken that away from us too. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said famously, you know his famous quote, he says, what can my enemies do with me? My paradise is in my breast. It goes with me wherever I go. My, my being executed is martyrdom. And my expulsion, my being uh, you know, expelled from a land is tourism. So what can my enemies do? If they kill me, I'm a martyr. If they kick me out, it's more of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's land. And he says, my imprisonment is solitude with my Lord. Okay, there you go. What can my enemies do with me? But I want you to realize also that he didn't just, that doesn't come out of a vacuum. He trained himself to that level. He trained himself to be able to exercise that even when he was free. And so it was said that he used to go out outside of his, his neighborhood. He used to walk outside, walk away from people basically. And he used to say, min al buyuti la'allini. He used to say, min al buyuti la'allani anka nafsa bil khaliya. He said, and I exit, he recites this poem. And this poem was originally the poem of Majnoon Layla. And it says, I exit from my houses in the night, perhaps that I may speak about you to myself alone. Like I'm, I just want to talk to myself about you. So he wants to go out and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Majnoon of Layla, of course, literally Majnoon means insane. He's, there's a poet named uh, the Majnoon of Layla because he was completely, insanely in love with Layla, okay? And he wrote that verse about her, that he used to go out just so that he can mention his you know, his, the object of his love by himself. He wanted to talk to her like a madman or talk about her to himself like a madman. But Ibn Taymiyyah appropriated that verse to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to speak to, about Allah. He wants to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by himself. Uh, that verse, the verse of a majnoon of Layla, Layla means night, okay? Layla means night. So he says, أعد الليالي ليلة وقد عشت دهرا لا أعد الليالي وأخرج من بين البيوت لعلني أحدث عنك النفس بالليل خالية أراني إذا صليت يممت نحوها بوجهي وإن كان المصلى ورائية وما بإشراك ولكن حبها وعظم الجوى أعي الطبيب المداوية أحب من الأسماء ما وافق اسمها أو إشبهه أو كان منه مدانية so Layla means night right just so because he plays a lot on Layla and Layali and these words that mean night so I translated it as, I count the nights one after the other. And I spent a lifetime never counting nights in this way. And I leave the neighborhood so that I can remember you in the night alone, my thoughts replay. And I find myself turning my face in her direction, even if the Qibla is behind me when I pray. And I'm not committing shirk, but it's just her love. And I'm so ill, even the doctor's sick in disarray. I love names that match hers or resemble it or are near it in any way. I mean... There's a reason why they call him the Manic, the Majnoon of Layla, and not just the guy who's got a crush on Layla. It's because of verses like this and more. The difference between those who seek privacy to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who seek privacy to transgress against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like the difference between night and day. So we ask half ourselves, which one are we? The one who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude? what an excellent, excellent state they're in. And the one who seeks solitude so that they can violently sin against Allah, the Prophet ﷺ says in a terrifying hadith that there are, going to people, there are going to be people on the Day of Judgment who will come with mountains of good deeds, salah, fasting, all of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn it into scattered dust. And people will say, or the Sahaba عنهم, they actually asked, they said, Ya Rasulullah, like who are these people? And he said, they pray in the night like you pray. And they, 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 they pray in general like you pray. But 
What's the difference? What makes their, their deeds scatter like that? He says, they were a people they are a people who if they are alone with the transgressions of Allah, as soon as that last person leaves the house, as soon as they feel that they are private, they intihak literally means it's 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 got like this 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 aggression. Like they are so willing to transgress against the limits of Allah as soon as as soon as they're by themselves. The difference between these two is night and day. And so we have to make sure that we're in camp number one, and we have to make sure that we repent and protect ourselves from being camp number two. The last thing that I want to mention is that seclusion powers a really beautiful act of worship, which is called contemplation, tafakkur. And that can happen whether a person is in the privacy of their house, or whether a person is traveling, or whether a person is out in nature, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inform us to reflect on Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions His signs throughout the Qur'an. The interchanging of day and night, the descending of the rain, the creations of the heavens and the earth, the interchanging of the seasons, the earth coming back to life, life growing again, winter that turns into spring, the animal kingdom, safe passage on ships, birds flying through the air, like all of this are from the signs of Allah and Allah always says or continuously says for those who think, for those who contemplate, for those who reflect. And so actually going out and engaging these senses, engaging that intellect, engaging that reflection becomes this great act of worship, something that is powered by a person just enjoying stillness, cutting themselves off from distraction. And I remember traveling one time and, and thinking to myself, how do I fall to the illusion of this man-made world. You say, we say we traveled the world, which means that I went to the airport, I got onto a flight, I sat in a seat in the air, everything about it is man-made, and I fell asleep for six hours or seven hours or 12 hours or what have you, maybe ate some food, maybe watched some movies, and then I land in another man-made airport, and I say I traveled the world, right? I traveled halfway across the world. I want you to imagine this travel is so much different than a person who is seeing the mountains, a person who's looking up every night and seeing the vastness of the sky, a person who's seeing the greatness of the desert, a person who's seeing the vastness of the oceans. These people are witnessing the signs of Allah. A lot of times we don't see any of that even as we are traveling through the earth. Isn't that a sure recipe for a hardened heart? Maryam had secluded herself for all of these meanings and more. And it's in that state that the angels arrive to tell her what the next chapter of her life will be.